Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Cindy Cron. She's a North Coast Area IPM advisor with University of California Cooperative Extension uh, in Sonoma, Mendocino, Lake, and Napa counties. And today she's going to be speaking on insects in the vineyard. So now I'd like to pass this over to Cindy. So you can go ahead and start sharing. Today, um, I'm going to talk about insects in the vineyard. Um, so to get started, I do want to start out with um, this, <laughs> this piece of data that only 2 to 5% of insects are pest species. Um, I get a lot of response um, about concerned about insects being around um, people in the vineyard and in orchards and, and in other crops. And um, there, there is, I think, a certain misconceived notion that uh, all insects are bad or most insects are bad. But in, in reality, only two to five percent of insects are considered pest species of crops. Um, and so with that, the rest of the insects would be considered neutral insects um, or beneficial insects. Now, beneficial insects, we, we can understand that, but what is a neutral insect? And that's an insect that is present, but does not affect the crop itself. For instance, we have insects um, that are living on the ground cover in a vineyard. They never affect the grapevine. They reproduce on the ground cover. They're there, they're present. They're alternate food for um, predators. Um, so they help um, the, the system by giving extra food to predators um, outside of whatever pest species the predators are going for. Um, and so they, they play a role and an important role, but they, they're not a pest. Um, so with that in mind, Let's go into what is a pest. So is this deer a pest? And the answer is, is that it depends. The definite, uh, definition of a pest depends on the situation. So if this deer was in a forest, it would not be considered a pest. But if this deer was in your yard, um, you know, eating your garden, then you would consider it a pest. And so that is something to keep in mind that uh, the term pest can be situational. In some instances, it can be a beneficial. In some instances, it can be a pest. So that's something to keep in mind, too, as we move forward. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your economic injury level. And what does that mean? Um, so in the top graph, you see in the y-axis is the number of pests over time. And the red line, you can see the pests as it increases in numbers over time. It gets close to this economic injury level, EIL, that's in the blue line. And what that line is, is the point at which the costs of the losses um, from the pest damage would equal the cost of the control measures. So to uh, say we're, say pesticide is the control measure. It's, it's one that we easily can understand. Well, pesticides cost money for the actual pesticide. It costs money to um, have someone put out that pesticide um, in labor and in time. And so that's all factored into the cost of applying a control measure. So um, it's at that point that they're, they're equal. The cost to control is equal to the cost uh, of your losses. So if you go, uh, the pest population goes above that line, you can see it in the dotted red line here, um, the benefit of applying a co control measure outweighs the cost of applying that measure. But below the blue line, you can see that the cost um, is it's more expensive to apply a control measure than the benefit you're going to get from that. So it's the idea that just because an insect is present does not mean that it's causing a problem or that it's economic. Um, and so as the insect population rises, it crosses the economic threshold. And what that is, is the density, the pest density that should trigger a management action. And the reason being is that um, when you can put a, a control measure in place, it doesn't um, respond, it doesn't affect instantaneously. So it takes some time for that control measure to actually work um, and to actually show results. So you want um, an economic threshold before you reach the injury level, which would be economic. 
Something to keep in mind too is in the graph below that some insects are never economic pests. Their equilibrium position in which the number of their population always remains below the economic threshold and the economic injury level. Then we have natural enemies or parasitoids that keep them in check. And so their numbers fluctuate over time, but they never cause what would be considered economic damage. So with that aside, now we can move on to the fun part, which is insects. Um, so one more point I wanted to cover is incomplete metamorphosis and complete metamorphosis, because we are going to talk a little bit about this in the slides that come. Uh, complete metamorphosis is when you have um, larvae and adults look very different from each other. So here we have egg, um, caterpillar, pupa, and adult. So, the, so they go through these stages. And the adult looks very different from the larva, the immature stage. They have different mouth parts. Therefore, they feed on different have they have different feeding habits. So this falls into place of moths, butterflies, fly flies, beetles, wasps, bees. Um, are they all go through complete metamorphosis? Now, in complete metamorphosis, you have eggs, nymphs, and adults. And each time the nymph molts, they get a little bit larger. But the nymphs look very similar to the adult overall. The biggest difference is that the nymphs don't have full wings. But by the time they become an adult, they have full wings. But they have the same mouth parts. And therefore, they have the same feeding habits. And this is hemipterans, grasshoppers, katydids. So these are the group that we will be talking for in this section. So let's dive in. Pest insects and mites of grapevines. Um, pests can cause direct damage. Um, they can also, that damage also opens up the grapevine or fruit to secondary infections from bacteria or fungi that can get into the wounds, the feeding wounds. They can also vi uh, vector viruses, bacteria or fungus that cause disease. Um, so that is something that we're concerned about. We're going to start out with moths and butterflies. Um, so as you can see here, moths develop by complete metamorphosis. You have eggs, larva, pupa, adult. The larva and the adult have different mouth parts. Therefore, they cause different damage. Um, adults and, um, they, and they also have different uh, feeding habits because of their mouth parts. There are quite a few moths that lay their eggs on or near grapevines. One point to keep in mind is that uh, the moth larvae usually lack noticeable and reliable features to tell apart species. So when you're out in the field, it's hard to look at a larvae and be like, I know its species that is, where it's a lot easier to look at a moth or butterfly and say I, adult and know, say, I know its species that is. Um, different types of traps can be deployed to catch adult moths to determine what species is present and likely causing the damage. In addition, something to keep in mind is that moths are active at night and not during the day. So when you go out during the day, you're not likely to see the adults. It's at night in which they're active and you are likely to see them. So uh, variegated cutworm um, is one of the cutworms that causes damage in grapevines. Uh, we also have the spotted, the brassy, black or greasy, and the dark-sided cutworm. These cutworms usually cause economic damage to grapevines in early spring when the feeding damages or destroys developing buds. Um, the larvae emerge from the soil or under the bark and feed at night. So you'll often come across the damage during the daytime with no insect present. Um, so this is one of the features uh, that you find with cutworms. The next um, moth we're going to go to is the orange tortrix, which feeds on leaves and grape clusters and produces this webbing where they feed. So in the photo on the left, you can see this webbing that they produce. Um, using webbing at the shoot tips to fold leaves, creating these pockets that they can hide and feed inside of and that protects them from predators. It should be noted that other insects can cause similar damage, but not all of them produce this web webbing that you see. In early spring, um, cause damage to the grape buds and emerging shoots. Uh, the larvae will feed on grape clusters, which opens up the fruit to, to fungi and bacteria that can cause rot. 
Um, the photo on the right shows that the male and female are side by side, and right above it is a laid egg mass. So those are what the eggs look like. They are sort of some semi-flat and overlapping. Light brown opamoth, also known as Elbam, is very similar. Um, this they also fold their leaves and they and they also have webbing, very, very much like orange tortrix. The feeding damage to early spring buds and feeding on clusters is similar to the orange tortrix also. So this is where trapping comes into play of figuring out what um, what species are you dealing with. Uh, omnivorous leaf roller is another um, moth pest of grapevines, and it has similar behavior in feeding damage as the orange tortrix and elbam. So in the photos, you can see the eggs, and you can see the adult and the larva, and then also some feeding damage in which uh, material, because they have chewing mouth parts, they actually remove part of the leaf material and fold over the leaves. You can see the leaf on top is folded over. Western grape leaf skeletonizer. These guys are really cool looking. <laughs> um, it's they're very distinctive moth in both the larval and adult forms. And so in this case, you can you can tell what species you're dealing with when you're looking at the larval forms. Um, when the larvae emerge, they line up side by side and they feed together on the underside of the leaf, eating everything except the leaf veins on the top layer. Later, immature stages eat everything but the main veins and the grape leaves. These feeding behaviors are distinct for this species and easy to notice in the vineyard when you come across them. Unlike most moths, Western grape skeletonizer adults are active during the day. So these are not a nocturnal species. EGVM, also known as European grapevine moth, is an invasive species that was first detected in Napa in 2009. Over 2,000 square miles were placed under quarantine. Um, mandatory traps and treatment were required, and the goal was eradication, which was declared in 2016. But trapping for EGVM still continues to this day because it is a major pest. Um, the eggs are very small. You can see on the left-hand side is an egg uh, on a grape, berry, you know, on a, on a berry. Um, they laid singly on the berries or on the flower parts. Uh, larva feed on the flowers, the green berries, the ripe berries, so all the stages of the plant growth. Um, and they tunnel through the fruit and when feeding, which, which they leave the webbing and excrement behind. And they feed on ripe berries, which opens up the fruit to fungi and bacteria to enter and cause fruit rot to occur. So this is a really major pest. It's invasive. Um, it has been eradicated and hopefully it's never reintroduced um, into our wine grape growing regions. So now we're going to move on to the order Hemiptera. Um, and so in Hemipterans, they undergo incomplete metamorphosis. They have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, so they don't have the chewing mouth parts. They pierce into the plant material and they suck out the juices and that's how they feed. Um, adults and nymphs have very similar feeding habits, uh, and grape phylloxera is native to the United States. It feeds on the roots and leaves of grapevines. The photos on the slide show phylloxera on grapevine roots. So they're very tiny, um, and these photos were taken with magnification um, to show you some more detail, but it's very hard to see this detail in the field. Uh, phylloxera root feeding, uh, which results in stunted vine growth, decreased yields, and vine death. Uh, the damage patterns from phylloxera feeding in a vineyard tend to be circular patches of poor growth or vine death, as shown in the images on the slide. And so they have these circular patterns that, that then spread outward. And that's one of the um, noticing fe noticeable features of when you have phylloxera problems, since majority of the time they are um, under at the, on the roots in the soil, you're not necessarily going to see the the insect itself unless you dig up the roots. But you can see these patterns that indicate that it's possibly phylloxera. the The leaf form is called foliar phylloxera, which you can see in this photo. Um, and so they create the the females will feed um, on the leaf, and it creates this gall around the female. And if you cut off one of those galls, like you see here, on the left-hand side, you can see the female with some eggs. And so um, on the right-hand side, you see the gall completely filled with eggs for phylloxera that are hidden in this gall. It keeps them protected away from predators. 
Um, so that's what each of these little goals include. Okay, moving on to leaf hoppers. Uh, we have three main leaf hoppers that cause issues in vineyards: Virginia creeper, western grape, and variegated leaf hopper. The adult and nymphs of all three species are relatively the same size and shape, but they differentiate each other uh, from each other by their markings and their coloration. As you can see here, we have eggs, nymphs, and adults of all species. Um, Virginia creeper will lay their eggs singly, but more often in groups of two to nine eggs laid side by side, where Western grape leaf hopper eggs are always laid singly and usually in a bean shaped kind of pattern. So there's a little indentation. Um, both Virginia creeper and Western grape leaf hopper eggs create a, a raised blister appearance on the leaf. So it's a little raised bump. But um, variegate leaf hopper eggs are laid deep within the grape tissue and can uh, only be seen when you shine light through the leaf um, under magnification, as you can see um, in the photo above. Leaf hopper feeding damage is called stippling. Um, and basically they, they will um, have their piercing sucking mouth parts and they pierce the plant material and they suck out all the chlorophyll, which is what which produces this green color of a leaf. And that's why you end up with these white stippling uh, marks um, on the leaf. The black spots are their frass or their poop, basically. Um, and those are signs that leaf hoppers have been there in feeding. Um, so because they suck up the chlorophyll when they're feeding, it causes a reduction of photosynthesis in the leaves. This can affect the sugar accumulation, uh, carbohydrate stores, and in major infestations can completely defoliate the grapevine. Uh, these are all signs that leaf hoppers and, and their damage um, that have been present. Moving on. Uh, Moving on to thrips, these uh, insects are very small and they have rasping, sucking mouth parts. Two major species that can damage grapevines are the western flower thrips and the grape thrips. Um, again, these are very tiny insects. They're less than one millimeters in length and therefore they're difficult to see with the naked eye. Um, damage can be economic in table grapes because it can make the fruit unmarketable. Um, as you can see, the bunch on the left, I'm, I doubt you'd want to purchase this from the grocery store. Um, but it's not economic uh, most of the times in wine grapes. Um, and so you can also see the damage to the leaf from the feeding of the thrips on the leaves. Moving on to flies. There are seven species of Drosophila flies, also known as vinegar flies or pomace flies. Um, the general public uh, thinks of these as fruit flies. I grew up with them being called fruit flies, but that's an, it's actually not an accurate name. Um, but that's the fly we're talking about. Um, and, this can, and these can be found in the vineyard. They're small and they like to lay their eggs in the area between the ripening berries, slight separation from the stem. Um, the hatching larvae then will feed inside the ripe berry. The adult flies are attracted to the rotting fruit. And the greatest damage is caused by the adults picking up fungi and bacteria from the rotting fruit and spreading those pathogens around the vineyard to uninfected fruit. Grasshoppers, katydids, and earwigs have chewing mouth parts, so feeding damage from these insects will result in portion of the plants missing. In springtime, grasshoppers can arrive in the vineyard in large numbers when the vines are just beginning to push the leaves for the season and eat all of the new plant growth. They can also feed on the leaves and shoots in the, uh, in the mid season. Katydids may occasionally cause damage to ripe berries and leaves and the earwigs like to feed on grapevines in early spring when the newly pushed shoots and leaves are present. Um, so there's a lot of beetles and I cannot go in, we don't have enough time to go into all the detail of all the beetles, but here are six uh, major ones, branch and twig borer, click beetle, western grape rootworm, black vine, weevil, flea beetle, and grape bud beetle. Um, and they can cause damage to grape vines. Beetles have chewing mouth parts and they undergo a complete metamorphosis. Some burrow into the grape vines or the buds, some feed on the leaves or on the roots as larvae. Black widow spider. So moving on from insects into spiders and mites, the black widow spider does not affect grape vines. But their bite is poisonous to humans and therefore can affect uh, people that work in the vineyard. 
Spiders are predators and considered to be beneficial, but black widows specifically in the vineyard are considered a pest due to the negative impact on the human health. So um, black widow spiders are active at night and they like to hide in dark and sheltered places. They are often found in the cartons that protect newly planted vines. So extra precautions should be taken when you go to remove those cartons um, that there's not black widows inside of them. Grape uranium mite, also referred as the blister mite, is a very, very tiny insect. Um, it is less, it's about 0.25 millimeters in length. Um, and it can only be really seen under a magnification. Um, they create these blister like swellings that indicate blister mites are present. So you don't necessarily see the insect, but you see the you see the blisters um, in the leaf. So High infestations can lead to partially expanding and the leaves partially expanding and then dying uh, prematurely or um, maturing and falling from the vine earlier than unaffected vines. There are three spider mites that damage grapevines uh, that are common, Pacific spider mite, Willamette spider mite, and the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, the feeding damage from spider mites causes the leaves to turn yellow to a bronze color and can reduce sugar content in the grapes, yield, uh, berry size, and the number of fruit clusters. So a very helpful reference book that I use all the time um, is the Grape Pest Management book. Um, and if you're interested, it covers uh, pests including insects, mites, nematodes, vertebrates, weeds, bacterium, virus, fungi. It has a book um, with informative diagrams and plenty of photos, um, and it can be found at the ANR catalog.ucanr.edu if interested. So moving on to insects and nematodes that vector pathogens. A pathogen is a virus, a bacterium, or other microscopic organism that causes disease. Transmission of a pathogen is usually achieved uh, by insects feeding in an infected grapevine and then moving to an uninfected grapevine to feed again. Thus, the, the insect spreads the pathogen that causes disease in the vineyard. Mealybugs. <laughs> so the first disease that we will cover is grapevine leaf roll that is vectored by mealybugs and scale insects. Uh, there are quite a few different mealybugs that can be found in grapevines, such as grape, obscure, vine, long-tailed, and gills mealybug. Proper ID is important because life cycle and behaviors are different between the species, which affects what control measures would be effective against them. Mealybugs are really hard to manage in the vineyard because they're really small. Uh, they're able to hide under the bark and on the roots, which are very not easy to get to. Um, they can cause direct feeding damage, uh, but they also produce honeydew, which is the sugary liquid excrement that acts as a food source for sooty mold to grow that creates off characters in the wine produced from these grapes uh, that have the sooty mold. In addition, because they produce this honeydew, ants love to tend them. So ants will come and they will collect the honeydew. So it's a great rich sugar source for them. Um, and in return, ants protect them from, bio, from biocontrol, from predators and parasitoids. And ants will fight off predators and parasitoids. And they can't get to the mealybugs to um, be able to have the natural control and reduce the populations. So in that sense, ants become a pest in the vineyards. Although the ants are not causing direct damage to the grapevines, they're disrupting the biocontrol, which is causing ultimate damage to um, the grapevines. Other soft scale insects that are known to transmit grapevine leaf roll viruses, we have cottony vine scale, cottony maple scale, and European fruit lycanium scale. Um, these are all soft scale insects that can be found in the vineyard, but it's not very common to find these. Um, but they do exist and we do see them on grapevines from now, now and then. Um, three corner alfalfa hopper is a vector of grapevine red blotch virus. Um, and this insect is native to the US. And it um, is known to girdle grapevine petioles as seen in the photo on the left. Um, and you can see on the photo on the right, the adults are lined up on a shoot um, feeding. Legumes are their preferred host. 
Uh, overwintering generations of adults arrive in the vineyard in February. They lay their eggs in the ground cover and die off. Immature stages develop on ground cover. And mid-May, the first generation emerges. And then we start to see girdling in the canopy in June, in which uh, it, they're allowed to, uh, if, there, if the virus is present, they can acquire the virus and then they can move it to, to sub subsequent vines that they feed on that don't have the virus. And we have one to two generations per year. Um, this photo here, these two photos show the immature stages that you would find on the ground cover. They have really awesome mohawks. I like these. <laughs> Glassy ring sharpshooter, also known as Gwis, is native to the southeastern U.S. Um, and it vectors Xylella fastidiosa, which is a bacterium that causes Pierce's disease. Uh, citrus is also a host, and oftentimes Gwis gets moved around from nurseries on citrus plants. Um, so large efforts are in play in California to prevent the movement of glassy wing sharpshooter into vineyards in Northern California. In addition, other sharpshooter and spittlebug species can transmit the bacterium that causes Pierce's disease as seen on this slide. So you can see quite a few different options, blue, green, glassy wings, uh, sorry, redheaded, green, willow sharpshooter, meadow spittlebug, there's quite a few um, other vectors of Xylella fastidiosa. Uh, grapevine family degenerative virus. So we have a vectors um, by ne a nematode called Zymphonema index, which is a species, and it's also referred to as the California dagger nematode. Um, nematode is is a wor is worm like in shape and it's very very small. So this is under magnification. The photo that you see here. Um, uh, causes the direct damage to the grapevine root tips when feeding, but it's also able to acquire and transmit um, the grapevine family virus, which causes, is why it causes such a problem. So a great resource that's free, ipm.ucdavis.edu. Um, if you go to this page and at the top, you scroll down um, to agricultural pest, as you can see here, you can choose your crop that you're interested in. So we chose grape. Um, and under grape, you have a range of articles that you can read about diseases, insects and mites, nematodes, weeds, vertebrates. Um, these are all pests and you're able to read more about the, the biology, the behavior, um, control measures. Um, so this is a, a free for anyone to access um, and gain more knowledge about these insect pests. Going on to beneficial insects in the vineyard, an insect is beneficial if it contributes to reducing insect pest populations in the vineyard by preying on or parasitizing pest species. We have predators and the behavior of predators is our insects that attack, kill and feed on other insects are, um, are called our predators. Um, they will feed on many insects in their lifetime. Some are specialized in that they feed only on one kind of insect or a few closely related insects and other predators are generalist predators, meaning that they'll feed on a variety of insects. Parasitoids are immature insects that derive their nutrients from living on or in another species, also known as their host. The host dies when the parasitoid reaches maturity. The relationship between the parasitoid and the host is pretty specific. Um, they usually, one parasitoid will parasite, parasitize one host to complete their life cycle. Um, and adults are free living and not dependent on the host. Okay, um, hemipterans uh, as, as beneficial insects. Uh, so you can see assassin bug, predatory stink bug, minute pyre bug, damsel bug, and big eye bug are some of the, um, the, the uh, beneficial insects in the order Hemiptera. Keep in mind the general size of each insect, which is listed on this slide under each photo, because the photos can really make the insects look larger than you find them in the field. So um, a lot of these are definitely zoomed in and it makes the insect look really large, but some of these are pretty tiny insects that we see out in the, in the vineyard. So um, some species of stink bugs feed on plants and some are predatory. Of the stink bugs that feed on plants, most feed on the weeds in the vineyard, making them a neutral insect in the vineyard. You can purchase assassin bugs, predatory stink bugs, and minute pirate bugs in bio, to be used for biocontrol releases. Now moving on to beneficial beetles. 
Um, there are all common names for the different families of beetles. Each family consists of hundreds and sometimes thousands of species. So a wide variation in size and coloration exists than the photos that I've put up here. For instance, our ground beetles, we have more than 40,000 species worldwide. The ladybird beetles, we have um, about 500 species in the US and Canada. And rove beetles, we have about 3,100 species in North America. So there's a lot of different variation that can be seen in these families. Um, you can purchase ladybird beetles and rove beetles for biocontrol releases. Flies, a lot of people think of flies as always being bad and nasty, but we do have some beneficial flies out there. Um, the photos show on top the larvae um, and the corresponding adults right below them. So the larvae of all three species are predaceous, whereas the adults are not predaceous, but feed on nectar and pollen. Surfid flies are also called hoverflies um, or flower flies. These flies are often confused for bees or wasps because of their coloration. Um, you can purchase surfid fly and predaceous midge larvae for biocontrol releases. Robber flies, these guys are cool. Um, so these are predator, great predators um, that can catch large prey in mid-flight. Um, and they can be from nine to 25 millimeters in lake, length, and they have this bearded face and an indentation on top of their head between their eyes. Some are bumblebee mimics as shown in the slide where they, they mimic a bumblebee, but they're obviously, they, you know, not. Yeah, so these are great predators to have around. Wasp, um, a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize that wasps can also be beneficial insects. The larvae of the spider wasp are external parasites of spiders. The sphesphid wasps include digger wasp and mud daubers and sand, sand wasp. The adult and larvae of, are both predaceous. Female velvet ants are wingless, whereas the males have wings. The larvae are external parasite, parasites of wasps, bees, beetles, and flies, depending on the species. And then we have our vespid wasps that include your hornets, your paper wasps, and your yellow jackets. Both adults and larvae are predaceous. A lot of people don't realize that. Okay, snake flies and lace wings. Photos show the adults on top and the corresponding immature stages on bottom. Both the larvae and the adult snake fly are predaceous, and both the adult um, most oh, sorry, and both the, the larvae and adult of the brown lace wings are predaceous. Um, most adult green lace wings feed on honeydew, nectar, and pollen, whereas the larvae are voracious predators. They're really fun to watch when they feed the, the green lace wing larvae. They are voracious feeders. Um, so the brown lace wings you tend to see in cooler weather where the green lace wings tend to like the warmer weather. Um, and you can purchase um, both green and brown lace wings for biocontrol releases. Mantids, um, or also known as praying mantises, can be found in the vineyard, and they are predators. They range from light tan to dark brown or green. Um, their egg cases can be found on metal or wood stakes, barks of trees um, in the vineyard, and this is what they look like on the left-hand side. Um, <clears throat> mantid egg cases are commercially available, but they're not usually purchased for release in vineyards. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies are both aquatic when immature, and they both, um, adults and immature stages, are predaceous. These are good predators to have around, and they can be found in and around the vineyard in a wide range of colors and wing patterns, especially if you have an irrigation pond or just a general pond or a body of water, uh, you're likely to find dragonflies and damselflies. Um, thrips. So we think of thrips as like pest species, but we do have beneficial thrips. Six spotted thrips and black hunter thrips are both predatory um, and consider beneficial insects in the vineyard. Black hunter thrips are slightly larger than pest thrips. They're noticeably black in coloration with a very cylindrical and elongated head. Um, the six spotted thrips look very similar to the pest species, but they have six noticeable spots that can be seen on their wings um, that differentiate them. Um, now moving away from insects and onto arachnids, which includes spiders and mites. There are quite a variety of spiders that can be found in the vineyard. Um, all spiders are predaceous, but some spiders are generalists and others are more specific in their prey choices. So some spiders like to spin a web and wait for the prey to be caught in it, and other spiders actively hunt for their prey. 
Um, most spiders avoid humans. Uh, they, they definitely are not seeking us out. Um, there are, uh, so going on to predatory mites um, that feed on spider mites, thrips, leafhopper nymphs, et cetera, in the vineyard. Predatory mites tend to be more pear-shaped than your spider mite. Um, and so as you can look at them side by side, the predatory mite tends to have a different shape than your spider mite. Um, photos on the slide show the predatory mites feeding on spider mites and leafhopper nymphs. Um, different species of predatory mites can be purchased for biocontrol releases. So now we're going to move on to parasitoids. Parasitoids tend to have a specialized relationship with the insects that they parasitize, and they will parasitize only one or very few closely related host species. In addition, they'll parasitize only one life stage of their host. So they'll only parasitize the egg or the larva or the adult stage of their, their host species. <clears throat> there are signs that parasitism is occurring when you look at insects. Um, it's important to pay attention for these signs when scouting for pest insects before moving forward with treatment options. In some situations, uh, if predators and parasitoids are naturally controlling your pest population, there's no need for further intervention. They naturally will keep each other in check. Um, so as you can see in the photos here, the photo on top on the left-hand side is a Virginia creeper leafhopper eggs. And you can see that there's one egg, uh, sorry, one eye spot for each egg. And down below, um, these are parasitized uh, Virginia creeper leafhopper eggs. And there's two eye spots, um, and this one, the second one is a more mature uh, parasitoid is about to emerge, and it's definitely darker in color than your leafhopper that would emerge. And the photo of the top in the middle is, is uh, stink bug eggs that have been parasitized, and they're blackened. You have uh, circular exit holes like you do um, in the scale below. So this very circular exit hole is common in parasitoids. And it's a sign that parasitism is happening. Uh, like your, your aphids in the bottom right photo, the yellow ones are healthy aphids. When the aphids have been parasitized, they, they sort of balloon up, they change in color, they no longer move. And then eventually a parasitoid will emerge, create a circular hole and exit the aphid. So these are all signs that parasitism is happening. There's a wide range of parasitoid wasps that are active in the vineyard. Many are super tiny. Some of the pests that a parasitoids attack in the vineyard are different species of millibugs, moth larvae, aphids, scales, white flies, psyllids, beetle larvae, stink bug eggs, grasshoppers, leafhoppers. It's a wide range. Some are commercially available for biocontrol releases for control of certain pest species. With that, we have the Natural ha uh, Enemies Handbook. Again, this is an uh, A&R catalog book that helps guide you through different natural enemies, but you can also access some free information. Um, again, ipm.ucanr.edu under Natural Enemies Gallery, um, and there'll be plenty of different natural enemies that you can read up under that page. Very quickly, spotted lanternfly, it's a new invasive pest um, into the US. It's on the East Coast. It is not here in California yet, um, but one of its preferred hosts are grapevines. So this insect um, is about an inch long. It's very noticeable in its markings. Um, it's found in both agricultural and urban areas. Uh, the tree of heaven is one of its favorite crops our favorite host species. You can see here on the tree, they can aggregate in very large numbers. They can feed on grapevine to the point in an aggregation of killing the grapevine. This is why it's a concern uh, of this insect arriving. They produce a very large amount of honeydew, which again is a substrate for sooty mold. Um, none of these situations are great for uh, wine grape growers or table grape growers. Spotted lanternfly eggs are on top. You can see uh, covered by a waxy deposit and underneath that deposit, you see rows of these eggs. They can lay eggs on anything. This is one of the problems with this insect. On the railway cars, on, on lawn furniture, on, on, on um, 
firewood, it, on, on, on inanimate objects, stones, pallets, poles. So this is one of the problems in, in moving this insect around is that it's very easy to introduce it into a new area um, unbeknownst to whoever's um, moving the material. So this is what the insect looks like uh, as far as first through third uh, immature stage is on the left with black and white dots. And the fourth immature stage is on the right, red, black and white, very bright and vibrant and noticeable. The adults, um, you see I have these spots on them. They, again, these are about one inch long, so they're a pretty large insect. Um, when you disturb this insect, it'll move its fr front wings forward, show you the hind wings, which are bright red with black dots. Um, and so again, if you ever see something like this, if you think you're, you're coming across any um, life stage of spotted lanternfly, please um, collect the insect in a sealed container and document the location and date where you found before taking it to your local county agricultural commissioner's office or UC Cooperative Extension office. Um, we definitely wanna keep this insect out of California. You can read more about exotic and invasive pests. Uh, again, ipm.ucanr.edu. Scroll down to exotic invasive pests. We have plenty of information available. Um, and also on my page, ucanr.edu forward slash NCIPM stands for North Coast IPM. I have an article um, that I've written with plenty of photos. It is both um, in English and also in Spanish, downloadable. Um, and so you can download more information about this insect along with photos for identification. And with that, um, because I started a little late, we are really pretty much at time. So if you have questions, please email me. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate your presentation. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close out. So I hope everybody has a great rest of your afternoon.